You can start. Um, <clears throat> we're in um, our Wednesday night Bible study. We are now um, venturing into 2 Samuel chapter 3. And I just want to do a quick recap of 2 Samuel chapter 2 um, because it, it's some important things that were laid forth. Um, in chapter 2, Abner, who was the captain of King Saul's host, took it upon himself to take one of Saul's surviving sons by the name of Ishbosheth. We're looking at, I want you to look at um, 2 Samuel chapter 2, verse 8. He took Ishbosheth and brought him to Mahanan and made him king over Gilead and over the Asherites and over Jezreel and over Ephraim and over Benjamin and over all Israel. So he basically anointed Ishbosheth or appointed Ishbosheth, made him king over most of the Israelites outside of the tribe of Judah. Ishbosheth. Saul's son was 40 years old when he began to reign over Israel and reigned two years. But the house of Judah followed David. It's amazing that, that the praise follows the real king. Amen. And then what we find out is it goes through and it says that there was a time um, that the some of Abner's and it says, let's, let's just read through. It says, in the time that David was king over Hebron, over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. And Abner, the son of Ner, and the servants of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out from Mahanim to Gibeon. And Joab, the son of Zariah, and the servants of David, Joab being David's captain of the host, went out and met together by the pool of Gibeon, and they sat down, one on the one side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. Abner said to Joab, let the young men now arise and play before us or compete before us. And Joab said, let them arise. So this was basically, um, if you imagine in today's vernacular terminology, two military forces. Um, because Joab and Abner were both military leaders, and they had some elite troops with them, and they were encamped on either side of the pool, and these two leaders got together and said, hey, let's see what our men can do. You know, it would be um, something like the, you know, you know, I got a Marine in the house. It would be something like how the Navy and the Marines, you know, what is a... Yeah, it's all the time, you know, they want to compete, you know. Um, you know, you're a squabby or a swabby, and you're, um, I don't know what they call it, leatherneck or something, and they jar head, and they always competing. And so it was supposed to be, you know, martial arts and different things to show different type of skills. Then there rose and went over the number of 12 Benjamin, who pertained to Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and 12 servants of David. And they caught everyone his fellow by the head and thrust his sword in his fellow's side. So they fell down together. Wherefore, the place was called Helkath Hazarim, which is in Gibeon. And there was a very sore battle that day. And Abner was beaten and the men of Israel before the servants of David. And there were three sons of Zariah, Joab. Abishai and Asahel and Asahel was light of foot as a wild roe he was fast and Asahel pursued after Abner and in going he turned not to the right hand nor to the left hand from following Abner now when we talked about this last time I, I, I got some new revelation um, Abner was the captain of the host he was probably an older um, gentlemen than most of you like Asahel but I believe that Abner was had had developed what they call battle toughness and experience 
and he just understood how. See, sometimes, you know, it, it, that's why the Bible says it's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit. It also can say that it's not always the biggest, strongest, or fastest can win the battle. Sometimes it's about the heart, the experience, the ability to uh, plan to think, outthink your opponent. And I believe that was what was interesting about Abner. He had the ability to outthink his opponent. So when Abner, verse 20, looked behind him, he said, Thou art Asahel, and he answered, I am. Abner said to him, Turn away. Go to the right hand or to the left and lay hold of one of the young. Go fight somebody young, one of the young men, and take thee his armor. But Asahel would not turn aside from following him. And Abner said again to Asahel, listen, man, you are out of your league. Turn aside from following me. Wherefore should I smite thee to the ground? How then will I hold my face up to Joab, thy brother? I don't want to hurt you because I, then I have to deal with Joab. Howbeit he refused to turn aside. Wherefore Abner with the hinder end of his spear spoke him under the fifth rib that the spear came out behind them, behind him, and he fell down there and died in the same place. And it came to pass that as many that came to the place where Asahel fell, fell down and died, stood still. Joab also and Abishai pursued after Abner, and the sun went down where they were come to the hill of Amma that lieth before Gia in the way of the wilderness of Gibeon. And the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together after Abner and came one troop, became one troop, and stood on top of a hill. Then Abner called to Joab and said, Shall the sword devour forever? Knowest thou not all be bitterness in the latter end? How long shall it be then, ere bid the people return from following their brethren? And Joab said, As God lives... Unless thou hast spoken, surely then the morning, in the morning the people had gone, every one from following his brother. So Joab blew a trumpet, and all the people stood still and pursued after Israel no more, neither fought them any more. And Abner and his men walked all that night through the plain and passed over Jordan and went through Bithron, and they came to Mahianim. And Joab returned from following Abner, and when he had gathered all the people together, there lacked of David's servants 19 men and Asahel. But the servants of David had smitten of Benjamin and of Abner's men, so that 360 men died. And they took up Asahel and buried him in the sepulcher of his father, which was in Bethlehem, and Joab and his men went all night, and they came to Hebron at the break of day. And right before we get into chapter 3, um, we, just to recap, I had noticed that what has now taken place, and God showed me that it happens in the life of every believer. What has taken place now in the country of Israel is there now is a transition of kingship and every person that grew up serving one king the enemy of our soul we serve we serve the devil we serve sin and then we were introduced we were given the gospel of Jesus Christ and in that reception of the gospel we have accepted the gospel and we have now made Jesus Lord over our life, but the enemy does not let go easily. And if you go, if all of us think back to our, our early stages of salvation, there was a battle, an internal battle and an external battle for our very soul. And I believe this represents in the natural realm the battle that is taking place between the old life and the old against what is new and the old is refusing to allow David to become king 
So as we go on to chapter 3, we'll notice now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. But David got stronger and stronger. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And the house of Saul waxed weaker and weaker. And unto David were sons born in Hebron. And his firstborn was Amnon the, of Ahan, uh, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess. And his second Chiliab of Abigail the wife of Nabal the Carmelite. The third, Absalom, remember that name, the son of Makkah, the daughter of Tima, king of Geshur. The fourth, Adonijah, the son of Haggith. And the fifth, Stepha, Stephatia, the son of Abital. And the sixth, Ithrim, by Egla, David's wife. These were born to David in Hebron. And it came to pass, while there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, that Abner made himself strong for the house of Saul. And Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, and Ishbosheth said to Abner, Wherefore hast thou gone in unto my father's concubine? Then was Abner very angry for the words of Ishbosheth and said, Am I a dog's head which, show, which against Judah do show kindness this day unto the house of Saul thy father to his brethren and to his friends and have not delivered thee into the hand of David that thou chargest me today with a fault concerning this woman? In other words, what is taking place is Ishbosheth has accused Abner of, I believe, an affair with one of the late King Saul's concubines. Abner took great offense to it and has made it, is making it clear to Ishbosheth that he is the reason that Ishbosheth is still in power. Because if he had not have made himself strong on behalf of Ishbosheth, he could have been turned him over to David. So he says, but you, instead of showing me kindness for what I've done for you, you want to charge me concerning this woman. So do God to Abner, and more also except as the Lord has sworn to David, even so I do to him. To translate the kingdom from the house of Saul and to set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah. From Dan even to Beersheba. So now Abner has now finally accepted the fact that the kingdom has been translated and belongs to David. And he could not answer Abner a word again because he feared him. And Abner sent messengers to David on his behalf, saying, Who is the land? Whose is the land? Saying also, Make thy league with me, and behold, my hand shall be with thee, to bring about all Israel unto thee. Abner has now sent the message to David, saying, Hey, I am ready to submit myself and all of my forces to your control. I will pledge my allegiance to you. The problem is the, uh, the issue with Israel has never been addressed. And Israel, being Joab's brother is going to be an issue. So David sent messages to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, Deliver me my wife, Michael, which I, es which I espouse to me for a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. I earned it because your father gave me a challenge, and I, I exceeded the challenge, but then your father betrayed me and double-crossed me. It's an Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband, even Fatiel, son of Laish. And her husband went with her along, weeping behind her 
to Bahurim, then said Abner unto him, go, return, and he returned. So her husband followed after her husband that really wasn't her husband because she had been espoused to David. And Abner had communication with the elders of Israel, saying, You sought for David in times past to be king over you. Now do it, now then do it. For the Lord have spoken of David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, will I save my people Israel out of the hand of the Philistines and out of the hand of all their enemies. And Abner also spake in the ears of Benjamin, and Abner also spake in the ears of David in Hebron all that seemed good to Israel, and that seemed good to the whole house of Benjamin. So Abner came to David in Hebron, and twenty men with him, and David made Abner and the men that were with him a feast. And Abner said unto David, I will arise and go, and I will gather all Israel unto my lord the king, that they may make a league with thee, and that thou mayest reign over all that thine heart desireth. And David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. Now, as we have said many times since we've been studying this now from 1 Samuel to 2 Samuel, I don't think there's any thing that Hollywood could produce that has more intrigue and drama as what is going on between these leaders in Israel. Um, you know, there is um, betrayal, there is treason, there's, I mean, all of these things are happening because you know, they, they always say there needs to be a smooth transition of power. But it looks in this case as though the transition of power is difficult. So, David, the her, behold, the servant of David, verse 22, and Joab came from pursuing a troop and brought in a great spoil with them. But Abner was not with David in Hebron, for he had sent him away, and he was gone in peace. When Joab and all the hosts that were with him were come, they told Joab, saying, Abner, the son of Ner, came to the king, and he have sent him away, and he is gone in peace. Then Joab came to the king and said, What hast thou done? Behold, Abner came to thee, why is it that thou hast sent him away, and he is quite gone? Thou knowest, Abner, the son of Ner, that he came to deceive thee, to know thy going out and thy coming in, to know all that thou doest. And when Joab was come out from David, he sent messengers after Abner, which brought him again from the well of Sirah, but David knew it not. And when Abner was returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside to the gate to speak with him quietly and smote him there under the fifth rib, that he died for the blood of Asahel, his brother. And afterward, when David heard it, he said, I and my kingdom are guiltless before the Lord forever for the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. Let it rest on the head of Joab and all his father's house, and let there not fail from the house of Joab one that hath an issue, or that is a leper, or that leaneth on a staff, or that falleth on the sword, or that lacketh bread. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, slew Abner because he had slain their brother Asahel at Gibeon in the battle. And David said to Joab, to all the people that were with him, rend your clothes and gird you with sackcloth and mourn before Abner. And King David himself 
follow the casket. And they buried Abner in Hebron. And the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner. And all the people wept. And the king lamented over Abner and said, Died Abner as a fool dieth? Thy hands were not bound, nor thy feet put in fetters, as a man falleth before wicked men, so fellest thou. And all the people wept over him. And when all the people came to cause David to eat meat while it was yet day, David swear, saying, So do God to me, and more also, if I taste bread or aught else till the sun be down. And all the people took notice of it, and it pleased them, as whatsoever the king did pleased all the people. For all the people in all Israel understood that day that it was not the king to slay Abner the son of Ner. And the king said unto his servants, Know ye not there is a prince and a great man falling this day in Israel? And I am this day weak. Though anointed king, and these sons of Zerah be hard, too hard for me, the Lord shall reward the doer of evil according to his wickedness. So this story was basically about the conflict between the house of David and the house of Ishbosheth, but mainly between the captains of the host being Abner and Joab. And Joab, out of revenge, killed Abner, but I don't think he did it to the pleasure of King David. I think David thought that the alliance that would have been formed with Abner on his side would have made Israel stronger as a country than it would be without Abner and his influence over Benjamin and the um, Ephraim and those, and those other forces. So um, I think David, being the king, understood the big picture. Joab only wanted revenge. Um, the thing about revenge, I think it's commonly said that if you go for revenge, always dig two graves. One for the one you want to get revenge against and one for yourself because you never really can come back from that type of vengeance because, and the problem is, the Bible clearly says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And I believe because Joab sought vengeance on his own, it displeased David the same way it would displease, it displeases our Lord and Savior when we go after personal revenge. That's why um, it was ironic, not ironic, but a lot of Jesus' teachings are so deep when you really think about it. He said, pray for your enemies. He said, if your enemy thirsts, give him a glass of water. If he takes your, sh your coat, give him your shirt too. When you really understand Jesus was, was trying to teach at such a high level of holiness, it's very difficult for us even to articulate or even understand. If he hits you in your jaw, Jesus said, turn the other cheek. <laughs> that's, a, that's a deep teaching. You have to really, really, really be ready to, I mean, I'm not going to try to, it ain't easy. Somebody hit me in the face. I'm going to have to go into tongues real fast, you know. Um, but let's, let's move on. I want to get, we'll get into chapter 3 because I think now we need to see some, some additional things, the connections here. And when Saul's son heard that Abner was dead in Hebron, his hands were feeble. Uh, he got a little nervous. He was a little shaken. And the, all the Israelites were troubled because their greatest leader is now gone. And Saul's son had two men that were captains of bands. The name of one was Bayanah, and the name of the other was Rechab. 
and the sons of Remna, the Bethrahite, the sons of Benjamin, for Bethra was also reckoned to Benjamin. So these all were of the tribe of Benjamin, of whom Saul was the tribe of, which makes Ishbosheth the tribe of Benjamin. And the Bethrathites fled to Gidom and were sojourners there unto this day. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it came to pass as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. Very important name. If you're keeping notes, make a note, put a star by it, because we're going to revisit in the future the importance of Mephibosheth. And the sons of Remlam, the Bethrahite, Rechab and Bana went and came about the heat of the day to the house of Ishbosheth, who lay on a bed at noon. And they came thither to the midst of the house as, they, as though they would have fetched wheat. And they smote him under the fifth rib, and Rechab and his brother escaped. Is that, um, I'm going to talk to my military man, is under the fifth rib of uh, aiming point, uh, is that, that's uh, right under the rib cage, so it, you, don't run, you don't run into any bone and you can kind of work up in there. Okay, well they smote him under the fifth rib. So, so far in these two chapters we've seen three people smote under the fifth rib. I wonder if it's, did they say where Jesus was smote? It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't really articulate it as such, but I'm curious to see where Jesus maybe was wounded. I'm looking in Luke right now. And John, but I'm just very interested to see is that where is these are like pre determinations of where where Jesus would um, would be wounded. No, it just says um, in John 19:33 it says, when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was dead already. They break not his legs, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side. And, and forthwith came out blood and water. So it doesn't specifically say under the fifth rib, but I thought that would be a curious thing. But let's move on. I, I want you all to see something. Um, when they had came to his house, they lay up, he lay up. Uh, um, for when they came to the house, he lay on his bed in his bedchamber, and they smote him. And slew him and beheaded him and took his head. Now that's interesting. You notice that whenever someone was supposed to decrease so that there would be a change in leadership. And when, when Goliath, was, his head was taken. When John the Baptist was supposed to transfer leadership. John the Baptist was really supposed to be one of the 12. My study of scripture shows that he was supposed to be one of the 12 because his first couple of disciples went and followed Jesus. He should have went too because he knew that behold the some lamb of God would take away the sin of the world. But that's a whole nother, that's for another day. But leadership sometimes, when leadership refuses to submit to leadership, the only thing that can happen is the head gets taken off. The kingdom had been translated to David, not 
to the son of Saul. Saul's kingdom, the word was clear. It's been rent from you this day. The same way you rent the garment of Samuel, your kingdom has been taken away from you. So anything that was done to try to prevent that from happening would end up with the head of the false ruler being taken off. Another way to look at it is this. Many of us had issues that lorded over us before we got saved. And the Bible says that we must mortify or put to death. In other words, there's some things in us and some things in our life that we have to take the head off of. So that it no longer can raise its head up and, and no longer take authority over us. We are to take authority over it. Does that make any sense to anybody? There, there's some things in our past, some things in our life that we have to cut its head off. They gathered them away through the plain all night, and they brought the head of Ishbosheth unto David to Hebron, and said to the king, Behold, the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, thine enemy, which sought thy life, and the Lord hath avenged my Lord, the king this day of Saul, and of his seed. I find this to be very interesting because David said, David answered Rahab and Rahab and Bani, his brother, the sons of Remnam, the Bethrite, and said unto them, As the Lord liveth, who hath redeemed my soul from all out of all adversity? When one told me, saying, Behold, Saul is dead, Thinking to have brought me good tidings, I took hold of him and slew him in Ziklag, who thought I would have given him a reward for his tidings. How much more when wicked men have slain a righteous person in his own house, Upon his bed, shall I not therefore now require the blood for your, on your hand and take you away from the earth? And David commanded his young men, and they slew them and cut off their hands and their feet. Well, it was a time when, 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 when justice was brutal. <laughs> thank God that we've got a little bit of um, you know, y'all. You know, we thank God that we don't live in some countries that still honor these type of, of punishments. But they cut off their hands and their feet and hang them up over the pool in Hebron. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried him in the sepulcher of Abner and Hebron. So uh, we're just gonna wrap up right there so we basically got through two three and four tonight and it just shows the the struggle because it was it, it's not right now a smooth transition of power but the prophetic word that was spoken to David and over David must come to pass God said it like this my word which was spoken from my mouth, which proceeded out of my mouth, shall not fail or shall not be made void, but it will accomplish everything that I purpose for it. And the word over David's life and the word over David's soul was that he would rule the king, rule as king over all of Israel, and not only rule as king, but also he would deliver them from the hands of their enemies. He was the savior. And David did not take kindly when someone he thought criminally 
laid their hands out of revenge. You know, he said the other guy thought the one that claimed to have killed Saul thought that he would get a reward. Well, he got a reward. You guys thought that you had done me a favor, but you touched the son of God's anointed, and I'm just not going to accept it. Amen? Uh, and like I said, we'll be moving into chapter 5 because um, into next week where we're going to really begin to dig in to the establishment of David's kingdom. I think verses chapters 1 through 4 are the transition period where there was still enough remnants of Saul's kingdom to be a hindrance to the smooth transition of power of David's kingdom. But at the same time, these remnants had to be dealt with and addressed for David to assume full control. I believe in my heart of hearts that Abner and Ishbosheth had to die. I understand David's emotions about it, but I believe that they would have been a hindrance to the actual solidification of the Israel as one country. It has not been one country for several generations now, and David will be the king that will bring them back under one, one leader, one king. Amen. Hallelujah.